What's up, Lore Masters? Let's take a look at some of the ships that existed in the StarCraft universe. After crash landing in the Caprulu sector, the need for expansion and military dominance was apparent to the surviving Terrans. This would result in the creation of the Terran Battlecruiser. While we don't have definitive evidence one way or the other, the Battlecruiser, also known as the Terran Battleship, was most likely adapted from earlier Earth designs that were somehow in the databases of ships that were criminal transports. This assumption is largely due to the massive vessels being observed as a part of the United Earth Directorate's fleet during Earth's attempt to acquire the sector itself. Either way, the battleship would rise in dominance and be filled by every major power throughout the years. In the early era of Terran Caprulu sector history, capital ships and mid-sized vessels would be widely utilized to ensure the safety of the populace as well as to enact order. When Terran wraiths were introduced as a type of counter, engineers began to incorporate anti-air weapons as well as retrofit areas to allow for larger docking bays. Effectively flying cities, battlecruisers carry a complement of 4,000 to 8,000 personnel depending on the variant. This includes engineers, marines, pilots, ghosts, and other various crew. It would make the battlecruiser perfect for various roles including command and control, aerospace combat, as well as transport. The ship is equipped with all the standard rooms of war, but also include cantinas and recreational areas. Every variant of cruiser is also outfitted with gravity accelerators, the Terran fix to the zero-g question, along with warp drives that allow for faster-than-light travel. While different classes would begin to diversify drastically, battle cruisers are easily identified by the four large engines strapped to the back along with a long wingspan and hammerhead-like nose to the fore. All vessels come standard with the ATA-ATS laser batteries utilized for defense and offensive operations. These would often be supported by crews to ensure efficiency. Interestingly, there would also be shield systems that were powered from the fore section but were generally only utilized for entering and departing atmosphere as well as warp jumps. Power consumption was so drastic that use of the shields in combat was often impractical. Most all vessels would also have force field enclosed docking bays allowing for strike groups such as wraiths, dropships, and scout vessels to be deployed when necessary. The Leviathan variant would be one of the first battle cruisers during the late 2400s, but had very archaic designs. Among its flaws, the most notable would be the docking of the auxiliary craft near the bridge, making it extremely easy to board and commandeer the vessel. Terran engineers began to experiment with the design leading to the Behemoth class in 2478. The most common ship utilized during the Great War, the Confederate ship was armed with burst laser batteries as well as nuclear warheads. Newer variants of the Behemoth were outfitted with Colossus reactors to answer the massive energy requirements and for the use of the powerful Yamato cannon which could slice through any enemy target though the ship would still be using the archaic fusion reactors as well. The crew complement would range anywhere between 6,000 and 8,000 souls. The original design did not have the ability to defend its size, giving a massive advantage to faster ships. In order to utilize the more advanced systems, Behemoth-class vessels would rely on ground outposts that included physics labs. During the Brood Wars, mobile physics labs would be constructed near a battle line to assist battlecruisers in the area. A loss of the physics labs would mean the ships wouldn't be able to use some of their equipment due to not being able to finish calculations for their advanced weapon systems. Older Confederate models continued to use the outdated fusion reactors which would soon be considered antiquated. Often these reactors would have to be jury rigged in an extremely dangerous process to ensure the behemoth could output the same power as newer models. Even with its issues and outdated equipment, the behemoth would still see use on small scales well into 2511 and past the rule of Valerian. In 2502, the Minotaur class came into active service to ensure Terran Dominion dominance. The vessel sported upgraded tactical systems including the Type 5 Yamato cannon, energy shields, anti-air missile pods, and a defensive matrix. Additionally, Dominion engineers experimented with a type of short-range teleportation technology that would be widely used in the end war for ships to get from one place to another instantaneously. The updated fusion reactors would be more efficient with no leakage, a common issue for previous behemoth variants. The largest known buildup of Minotaur vessels was at the Battle of Core Hall 4, when all Dominion ships were ordered back to the capital to defend against the siege by the Zerg. The Hercules class would see large use during the early 2500s during the quote-unquote Brood Wars. Unfortunately, not much information is available about the variant beyond it having the same large energy requirements of similar battlecruisers of the time. 
In 2504, two different variants would be pushed into active service, including the Super Class and Gorgon Class. The Super Class is somewhat interesting. This variant was utilized both by the Terran Dominion as well as the United Earth Directorate. However, this is odd because the UED was isolated from the Terrans of the Capullo Sector. So both sides having the same ships would be an extraordinarily technological evolutionary coincidence. A non-zero chance of sorts. However, it can be explained away when we consider the Alexander, the Dominion flagship and superclass, was first observed in 2500 and the Loki, the Terran Dominion equivalent, was in the testing stages in 2504. It is possible the Dominion were able to get the schematics and fashion their own. Somehow. The superclass has similar weapons to that of other battlecruisers, but also is able to take off and land on planetary surfaces, as well as having technology that allows it to detect cloaked vessels. The Gorgon variant is considered to be the most powerful battlecruiser in the Capullo sector. The ship is easily identified with its elongated neck. It is equipped with optic sensors, multiple laser batteries, and fills a crew of up to 8,000 Terrans. It is also one of the few battlecruisers that can take sustained hits from the Yamato cannon of other battlecruisers before being disabled. In 2505, the Pride of Augustgrad class battlecruiser is observed in an attempt to defend August grad. There isn't much information on this variant, just its hyper-specialized use of defending the city of its namesake. The Sovereign, not that one but this one, would be fielded by the Dominion fleet under Matt Horner during the End War. Like others, we really don't have a lot of information on the variant. The Umajan battlecruiser, or mercenary variant, has been constructed from scraps of other vessels. They would feature a redesigning of the Neo Steel plating as well as an update to the Yamato cannon. There would additionally be the Star Cruiser, which was an advanced ship of the time that was sold at Crazy Bob's Bazaar. It was equipped with a Yamato gun and had more advanced weaponry to take on other aerospace vehicles. Ultimately, the Terran battlecruiser was the great equalizer in the Capullo sector. This vessel could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other Terran ships as well as alien equivalents. It was a vital piece to Terran operations. But what are your thoughts on the Terran battlecruiser? Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next Lore Reloaded.